So we're coming down to the end. We haven't had any kind of Internet of Things talks in this track before, so I'm kind of excited to hear about this. Uh, we're going to hear about um, speedometers, right? Sorry? We're talking about speedometers and, and things that you can put onto your, put on, put onto your bike. This is going to be really cool. Um, let's give, speaker, give our next speaker a big round of applause. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, I'm Toma. I'm from Hungary, and I work for a small IT security company as a pen tester developer, the company called PR Audit. Uh, I'm a regular speaker at uh, Hacktivity, Central Europe's biggest hacker convention, and I also gave a talk uh, about uh, insecure game scripting engines last year here at DEF CON. So the title of my talk is Help, I've Got Ants. What are we doing with the ants? Uh, last year, I've targeted one of my hobbies, uh, flight simulators. So I thought it would be appropriate to uh, target one of my other hobbies this year, mountain biking. And <coughs> slowly. Uh, and uh, while creating this slide, I've just realized that all of my hobbies includes crashing. Uh, <laughs> so mountain biking computer security, flight simulators, and recently drones. There's a lot of crashing there. I don't know about this. <laughs> OK, so so mountain biking and ants. Uh, what, what, does, what, what do ants have to do with mountain biking? Uh, there's a lots of uh, gadgets, there's uh, lots of equipment uh, involved in sports, involved in mountain biking and in cycling in general. And, uh, Old school speedometers got replaced by powerful, fairly powerful computers. Computers that talk to various sensors, uh, like speed sensors, uh, power meters, heart rate monitors, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and also uh, talk to uh, mobile phones or even your PC. And here is where Ant came in the picture because uh, Ant is a protocol uh, that these devices speak. Uh, it is not just used by uh, sports equipment, but uh, weight scales, but blood pressure monitors, or um, there, are even, there is even a chat application that uses it to create mesh network on Android. It's called FireChat. So in this talk, uh, I will uh, introduce you to Ant, Ant Plus, and the NTFS protocols, and I'll show you some uh, protocol level design errors, and uh, after that, some implementation errors in various Garmin devices. So, uh, Ant. Ant is a wireless protocol created by DynaStream, and uh, it is designed for low power devices. Uh, you can create uh, any kind of network topologies, and the participants are called nodes. There are slave and master nodes, uh, and these nodes are com communicating via uh, mutually as established channels. Uh, channels are mm, defined by lots and lots of uh, properties like uh, frequency uh, or mm, the channel ID. But the most important for us uh, from a security standpoint is the network ID because it contains an 8-byte uh, long number called network key, which according to DynaStream is a security measure. It's a security measure because uh, only nodes with the same network key can communicate with each other. It sounds good, but there are some problems. Uh, Network keys are managed uh, by DynaStream, and if you want, your, uh, want a network key for yourself, then you have to uh, purchase one from DynaStream. Uh, and if you use an invalid network, uh, network key, uh, then the protocol stack will just default to the public key, which is uh, public. You can download it from uh, DynaStream's uh, web page. Another problem with the network key, uh, it is being that uh, the majority of devices that use ANT actually use uh, ANT plus or ANT FS. And uh, these two protocols have their own uh, network key. Uh, and these network keys are also public. They can also be downloaded from DynaStream. 
So it's uh, not much of a security measure because everybody, everybody knows those keys. Okay, other security measures in AND. There's a pairing bit. Uh, it works like this. Two nodes can communicate with each other only if the pairing bit uh, is the same for the two nodes. So it does not have to be on, it just has to be the same on, on two nodes. Uh, this is fairly easy to circumvent because you can open two channels, one with the pairing bit off and the other with the pairing bit on, and one of these channels will succeed. I have first uh, noticed that there's something uh, fishy with this uh, pairing bit when I came home from a mountain bike trip and realized that, that uh, there are some heart rate uh, data on my charts, uh, despite I don't have a heart rate monitor, so <laughs> it must have picked, up, have picked it up from another cyclist or, or something like that. Okay, I'm gonna show you how easy it is to spoof uh, and sensor data. I'm just gonna uh, set up my uh, Freetan XT to use a power meter, and I'm gonna use uh, Simulant Plus, which is a software released by DynaStream to simulate a power sensor. Just creating the power sensor. Setting a sensor uh, data value that it will transmit, turn it on, and the watch should just pick up that signal and display uh, that value. And yeah, it did. So uh, without any pairing, it is this simple to spoof uh, and sensor data. Okay, back to uh, and security measures. Uh, there are these things called inclusion exclusion list and uh, white blacklist. They are uh, essentially the same uh, one for the slave notes, one the other for the uh, master notes. Mm, they could be useful, but there's a problem with them. They are uh, only available on fairly recent and chips, so. Uh, none of my Garmin devices uh, can use these features. Okay, another security measure, uh, ant channels can be encrypted with uh, AESCTR, but there are some problems with these too. Uh, you can't use them with shared channels, uh, which makes it uh, harder to implement uh, uh, implement it to, to have for example, one by computer with uh, multiple sensors. And also, uh, it requires advanced burst data mode, which is highly energy inefficient, and it's kind of a problem with low energy devices. So uh, these are problems, but these have uh, another bigger problem too. Uh, encryption can't be used with AND+. Plus. Uh, if you use encryption, then you are not uh, AND plus compliant and you can't interoperate with other uh, AND plus devices. Okay, so I've mentioned uh, this AND plus uh, several times already, but I did not tell you uh, what it is. It's a protocol built on top of AND and it basically just uh, specified so, specifies uh, so-called device profiles. So there's a device profile for uh, speed sensors, a device profile for uh, heart rate monitors, and so on and so on. Uh, these device profiles are uh, managed by DynaStream and they basically uh, just govern some characteristics of the end connection like uh, frequency, channel period, and data formats. Uh, a few examples of uh, these device profiles. This is a bicycle rear view radar that uses the radar and the light device profiles. A dropper seat post that uses the seat post device profile. Uh, a bicycle headlight, obviously the light profile, and the blood pressure monitor uh, that uses the blood pressure device profile. Okay, one of these device profiles uh, is called SYNC, and uh, it allows you to uh, collect and transfer uh, sensor data in the form of FIT files. So FIT 
uh, is basically a file system. Uh, yep, yeah, a file system. It's the file, file system, file format for uh, NTFS. Uh, the files are fairly simple. They have a 14 bytes uh, header, some data records, and the 2 bytes CRC. And all data records have their own uh, records header. It's a one byte header, and some record content. It, it can be anything really. So uh, they store um, recorded tracks, your settings, your name, etc. In, in these uh, FIT files. The reason I'm talking about uh, FIT files is that my first attempt to uh, hack my Freeton XT was to. Uh, try to find some memory corruption uh, vulnerabilities in the firmware, and I did that by uh, fuzzing the FIT SDK with AFL, and uh, I did uh, get some crashes, but they all seemed uh, non-exploitable. I've tried to upload them uh, to my Freeton XT nevertheless because I was hoping for some uh, crash dumps or crash logs or some useful information, but I did not get uh, either, so I, I got nothing. Uh, the watch did not crash. And uh, this got me thinking, uh, not this, uh, the Ant protocol stack became unavailable for a few minutes and that got me thinking that maybe the ant protocol stack, the NTFS protocol stack is implemented uh, in the ant chip and not the uh, actual Garmin firmware. So I have to uh, explore this further. Uh, it might be interesting. Okay, back to NTFS. Uh, according to DynaStream, NTFS is a secure and reliable file transfer protocol built on top of Ant. Uh, if you Google Garmin plus Ant, then you will uh, find some uh, rants on various forums about how reliable this stuff is, and I do question the security. Uh, there are two major security features according to DynaStream. One is the built-in encryption. Uh, so you can encrypt uh, your files, and they are also encrypted uh, while on the air. It sounds nice, but I've seen some NTFS implementations, but I did not see anyone that uses uh, this encryption feature. The other security uh, measure in NTFS is that it employs a uh, multiple authentication mechanisms. We'll see about them. There are three uh, authentication mechanisms. The first being the pass-through mode. It's not really an authentication mechanism because it works like this. The host just asks the client if it can connect, and the client just says, yes, why not? So uh, no information needed to, to connect. I don't know. Uh, why they did implement this, maybe some, uh, maybe for some testing purposes, but the important thing is that it is there and uh, you can use it. The second uh, authentication mechanism is uh, called pairing mode. Uh, don't confuse this with the ant uh, pairing bit. It's an entirely different uh, concept. Uh, it requires user interaction. Uh, the host sends a serial number and a friendly name to the client. The client device displays this information uh, to the user, and the user can uh, decide if she accepts the connection or not. If the user accepts the connection, uh, then a passkey is sent from the client to the host. The host stores this passkey and uses it for any further connections. So this pairing has to be uh, only once. OK, what's wrong with pairing mode? Uh, <clears throat> obviously, if you are a malicious host, then you can send any serial numbers or any friendly names to a client. So you can maybe get the user to accept the connection. Uh, this is one one way to attack pairing mode. The other is that uh, after a successful pairing, the passkey is sent from client to host, and it can be sniffed. How do we sniff AND? Uh, <coughs> the 
and chips that the majority of these devices use are NRF24 AP1 and AP2. And these are based on the very well known NRF24 S01 Plus chips. So they work in the 2.4 GHz ISM band. They have a 1 megabits per secundum uh, on our data rate. They use uh, GFS key. Uh, modulation, but the actual packet format is not really clear from the documentations. One of the papers mentioned uh, enhanced shock bursts, so I just went with that. But I only had an RTL SDR, which is not capable of uh, sniffing 2.4 gigahertz. But uh, luckily, I found this uh, blog post where this guy sniffs uh, an RF24 S01 packets with uh, an RTL SDR and an MMDS down converter. So I uh, ordered an MMDS down co converter, uh, set this all up, and try to decode RTL FM output as enhanced shock burst packets. It seemed to almost work, but every byte was the double of the ex expected. So either they, they are uh, very dumb and they use a brand new, highly sophisticated encryption algorithm where the crypt uh, where they just uh, multiply the plain text with two. Uh, I've seen some pretty dumb shit from developers, but this would have been a bit much of a stretch. So I just went with another idea that the documentation slide and uh, the packet format is not really enhanced short burst. Uh, I started reading about uh, enhanced shock burst, and uh, surprise, surprise, it turned out that <coughs> there is a shock burst protocol. The two, uh, the difference between the two uh, is a 9-bit field called, called uh, packet control field, uh, and it's being 9 bits, so it can happen that if you try to interpret a shock burst packet as an enhanced shock burst packet, that there is a one bit left shift, which is uh, multiplying with two. So uh, it seemed a reasonable uh, solution, so I uh, implemented shock burst decoding. I've implemented it as a C uh, program, and uh, which uh, outputs um, hex pairs, and I've also written an nteter.py, which interprets these uh, hex pairs as NTFS packets. Mm, this worked ni nicely uh, as a proof of concept, but I wanted something uh, cleaner, so I've implemented these uh, functionalities in uh, Potosfer as uh, two Potosfer blocks. Uh, if you don't know Potosfer, it's uh, very similar to uh, GNU Radio com Companion. I just uh, like to use it more. Okay, I have a video of this too. So this is the hardware, the MMDS down converter, and the RTL SDR, and I'm using a virtual machine with two anti-USB sticks here, uh, one for the NTFS host and the other for the NTFS client. So there will be a host and the client on the same machine and they will talk to each other. And we are going to sniff them uh, using these POTOS uh, blocks. Yeah, it's starting. Uh, so this one is the shock burst decoder and the uh, NTFS uh, decoder. I'm opening the uh, client channel, uh, the client beacons. We can already see the client beacons. And I will just try to search uh, for the client on the host. and. Uh, when the host finds the client, uh, it sends a link command which changes the uh, communication frequency. Uh, and this is why this uh, feedback from the NTFS decoder to the SDR source is there, uh, so it can change the uh, SDR source's frequency. Okay, uh, there are some serial number request uh, responses, some more beacons. And when we try to download the directory uh, listing, it's also file. Uh, there's download request response packet. And uh, this is actually the uh, directory listing. It's not uh, yet parsed. And 
This is where my uh, USB stack failed me. Uh, it did not uh, like all those data. Okay, so we've talked uh, about two uh, authentication mechanisms so far. Uh, the last one is the passkey mode. Uh, passkeys are up to 255 bytes long, uh, so brute forcing them is uh, impractical. But uh, as I've told you earlier, uh, after a successful pairing, the host remembers the passkey, uh, and the passkeys are stored in a directory structure, so uh, there's a client serial number and the corresponding uh, passkey, another serial number, another passkey, and so on and so on. And when the, the host encounters a client with a known serial, then it tries to uh, authenticate uh, with the stored passkey. This whole process could be a uh, man in the middle uh, by first posing uh, as NFS host, uh, acquiring the client serial number, then spoofing the serial number, acting as a client, uh, the host will send us the passkey, and we can then use this passkey to authenticate to the client. Uh, I've tried to use NFS PC tools for this, uh, and I've expected to, to, to find the passkey in the debug logs, but the actual passkey algorithm made it impossible because the host checks the uh, pass key length, uh, and uh, if it does not match the stored uh, length, then it aborts the authentication process. But since uh, we are the host in step two, uh, we can patch this uh, functionality uh, and, and still get the pass key. I found out that uh, the ant uh, wrappedlib.dll contains the code pass uh, for, for this functionality. I've almost uh, started to binary patch it, but noticed just in time that uh, uh, Dynastream actually released the source codes, so I just have to modify the C code and recompile the uh, DLL to do this attack. So as first step, we are going to uh, pose as a host and get the client serial number. I'm just setting up some things here, okay? And uh, I've also used, used my uh, free T for this. The host is searching for the client, and we should get the client information soon. Yeah, it's not the... Uh, not the fastest protocol, but we, yeah, we, we've got the uh, device ID, which will be needed. So with that device ID, we can start an NFS PC client and impersonate that client. Okay, I'm just skipping some parts. Yep, so... Uh, started the client, and I'm starting Garmin Express on my other computer, uh, where this uh, Freeton XT is already registered. And because Garmin Express thinks that this NFS PC client is this watch, uh, it will send the passkey to it. And we can see it in the debug logs. Okay opening the log files, and uh, these lines with, uh, starting with HCK, mm, those are the uh, patched in uh, stuff. There's the passkey length and the passkey itself, and now we can use that passkey uh, to authenticate to the watch and download the files from it. Uh, yeah. I'm just uh, copy-pasting that passkey. And 
starting the uh, channel, starting searching for the client, and uh, you can see that uh, there is no user interaction on the client side. Spassky, it succeeded, and we can download the directory structure uh, without uh, any user interaction from the client side. So this is how uh, this man-in-the-middle attack works. Okay, so uh, this was the part about the uh, design errors, the protocol level errors. So I, I just uh, recap it uh, and ask the question, is it all crap? And yeah, I have to say it uh, pretty much is. Uh, it is possible to uh, create a secure end connection, but you have to purchase your own uh, network key from Dynastream. You can't use uh, Ant Plus, so you won't be able to interoperate with uh, other Ant Plus devices. And also, you have to use uh, fairly recent Ant chips. So, uh, moving on to uh, implementation errors. I'm going to show you. Uh, implementation errors in Garmin devices uh, simply because I have those um, Garmin devices because of mountain biking, so I don't have anything against Garmin. I just use their stuff. Okay. Uh, the first authentication method was uh, the pass-through mode. And I've uh, assumed that it is only used for uh, testing or something like that. But of course, I've implemented it uh, in a little proof of concept script called hackant.py, and I've tried it uh, with both my Garmin uh, Freeton XT and with my Vivo Fit, uh, and it worked. So it means that you can uh, access all the files on these devices without any authentication, we're just using the pass-through mode. Uh, I'm showing, showing you this by downloading the directory structure uh, from a Vivo Fit using this pass-through mode, and uh, yeah, it succeeded. Oh, sorry. Uh, if this was not enough, there's another mode uh, which you can access, uh, I assume, all Garmin devices. I could access uh, every Garmin devices I've tried with this. Uh, and it works like uh, this. Mm. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I'm just confused the uh, slides. Okay, uh, so uh, there's a feature called uh, OTA firmware updates. There are lots and lots of uh, devices that uh, don't even have any other uh, communication method than ANT, so firmware updates have to be done via ANT. Uh, the firmware update method is uh, pretty well documented by, by Dynastream, but of course Garmin does not use this method. So I've started to uh, reverse engineer the Garmin Express services to learn how it actually works, but I've got distracted. I've got distracted by these two uh, methods, the first being compute factory pair uh, device pass key, and the other being has factory pair device pass key. I've assumed that uh, <coughs> they are using these for uh, bundled uh, devices, so you, you can uh, buy a watch and the heart rate monitor together, and they are factory uh, paired, so you don't have to do that. But, of course, I've implemented uh, this compute factory pair device pass key method in hackends.py2, and I've tried it with the Freeton XT and the Vivo Fit, and it worked in both cases. So it basically computes a pass key from the device's serial number and uses it for connection. 
The serial number, as I've shown you earlier, can be uh, obtained by uh, posing as a host, and we are posing as a host because we are trying to uh, download files from a client. And it worked. Uh, you can see that uh, here's the uh, device ID, the serial number, and the computed pass key. So this is another method to access uh, Garmin devices. Uh, one more thing about it, this uh, is that you uh, don't have to pose as a host to get the serial number uh, because they are uh, printed on the device itself and also on the packaging. So you can just walk into Best Buy, write down a lot of uh, serial numbers and then hack the devices later. So, okay, so I've started talking about uh, over the R firmware updates. Uh, and uh, it works like this with uh, Garmin uh, gadgets. The firmware updates are uh, RGN files with, uh, which are so-called region wrapped uh, firmware files. They have to be unwrapped and these unwrapped firmware file has to be uploaded to the NTFS directory uh, to the first index of the NTFS directory. Uh, it's that simple. Of course I've tried to uh, upload uh, firmwares that are modified, but at first I did not succeed. So uh, it was clear that there is some uh, firmware checking algorithm. And uh, in the VivoFit firmware, I found uh, two CRC16 tables and two CRC16 functions. But it turned out that uh, these were not used for uh, firmware integrity checking. But finding them was uh, still useful. And I love this about hacking that uh, th there's a lot of scenarios where you go down one, ro uh, one road and you expect some result. Uh, and you don't get that result, but what you get is still useful. So what, what was useful about this is uh, these functions used direct addresses uh, to the uh, CRC16 tables which made it possible to deduce uh, on what address the firmware is actually loaded in memory. So it was useful for me. But the actual uh, firmware integrity checking algorithm was much, much simpler than CRC16. Uh, it was, th there's just a requirement that the sum of all bytes have to be zero. It's fairly easy to calculate. So, I've also uh, implemented this feature in hackant.py, and I show you this by upgrading the VivoFit firmware after slightly modifying it. So, first, uh, unwrapping the uh, firmware file. Uh, modifying it, uh, I'm just gonna replace the string sleep with uh, another string uh, hacked. Okay, saving the file, uh, fixing the CRC, and uh, uploading uh, it to the device using hackant.py. Uploading it to the first index as a device file type. And uh, as you can see, uh, in the case of the VivoFit, it actually requires uh, user interaction because uh, <clears throat> the ANT protocol stack is uh, off by default uh, for the reason of preserving ba battery. But you can do this with the free 10 XT and uh, it requires no user interaction. I'm using the VivoFit for this demo because it's uh, a much simpler device and a much cheaper device, so it's uh, not that much of pain if I uh, break it somehow. Okay, so the firmware update succeeded, and uh, now we try to enter sleep mode, and it should display hacked instead of sleep. 
And yeah, it does. So, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks. Oh. Stop, stop, stop. Okay, so it was a, a very little modification, but uh, you can imagine that uh, there's a lot of stuff that can be done uh, with this. Okay, I have one other thing to uh, show you, uh, and it, it is not uh, strictly ant related, but I found this issue while doing this research. Uh, in the VivoFit firmware, I have found an XML string uh, which kind of looked like uh, some kind of uh, device descriptor file. And I've tried to reverse engineer the Garmin Connect uh, Android application to see, see uh, what this file is. And I have found some functions that download this file and process this file uh, from the device. A few years ago, I've reported uh, some XXC vulnerabilities to Garmin. At least I tried to report them, uh, got no response. So the first thought was that maybe this is XXC able too. Uh, I was thinking about uh, uh, attacking my phone via a modified firmware VivoFit using XXE. So I've just uh, replaced the XML string with an XXC stub that uh, uses a uh, external parameter entity to connect back to one of my servers, uh, uploaded this firmware to the uh, vivo feed and tried to connect it to my phone. Okay. Uh, and yeah, it's, uh, I, I'm going to disappoint you guys here because I don't have a video or a live demo of this, I've just had the have these uh, uh, screenshots. But the important thing is that uh, when I try to uh, connect my VivoFit to my uh, mobile phone, a connection came to my server. But the connection did not came from my mobile phone. It was not my IP address. But uh, after looking it up, it was a Garmin IP address. So. <laughs> What's happened is the mobile phone downloaded the XML file from the uh, Vivo Fit and uh, sent it directly without any modifications to a Garmin service, and the Garmin service was susceptible to XXE. Uh, and you can see it's even Java, so you can uh, do directory listings and stuff like that. And I think it's a really complicated but really nice way to find uh, a vulnerability like this in, in a major vendor's uh, internet accessible services. Okay, so this was the last thing I uh, wanted to show you guys. Uh, small summary, and is bad. Uh, I'm using it because I, I'm, I have these devices but it's really easy to sniff, really easy to uh, man in the middle. The security features are not really security features. They, they are fairly easy to circumvent. Uh, so it is really easy to steal your track data, your settings data, or your files uh, that are on these devices. Uh, or even, it is even possible to update, to replace uh, the firmware on your device without your knowledge uh, remotely. Okay, so uh, if you have uh, any questions, you can contact me in uh, these channels and the uh, scripts and uh, tools I've mentioned that I have written uh, will be available on my GitHub uh, later today. Uh, thank you very much for uh, listening to this talk. Bye-bye. <laughs>